I do not believe that religion is the root of all evil. Thank you, Channel 4. <laughs> religion is the root of quite a lot of evil, but that didn't make for a very catchy title. I just want to briefly reply to Dr. Spivey a couple of points. He says we're fighting a losing battle because uh, religion is a part of our human nature. Well, speak for yourself. It's not a part of mine, and it's not a part of the great majority of my friends in universities uh, in England and the United States and elsewhere. He also said, if we had no religion, how would we do without King's College Chapel, the Sistine Chapel, etc.? Well, you know, artists have to make a living. And in the time when the Sistine Chapel was built and its ceiling was painted, you know who had the money. Artists such as Michelangelo had to go where the patronage was. We shall never know the ceiling that Michelangelo might have painted if he had been commissioned to paint um, the Museum of Science, for example. We shall never know what Haydn's evolution oratorio might have sounded like, <laughs> or Beethoven's Mesozoic Symphony. I face two questions. Firstly, is religion true? And second, is it necessary for human psychological welfare or something of that sort? If it isn't true, then for anybody to maintain that somehow humans need it and you're wasting your time trying to get rid of it, what an amazingly patronizing and condescending thing to say. We intellectuals, of course, know that it's not true, but But, but all, those, all those poor people out there, they need religion. I mean, what a condescending thing to say about, about all those people. Either it's true or it's not. And I have enough respect for people to say that if it's not true, people will reconcile themselves to that and will not find any uh, need for it. Now, I was asked a specific question, is, there, is it in the genes? Is there some uh, Darwinian reason for uh, religiosity? Maybe there is, but that doesn't bear in the slightest degree on whether it's true. I care about whether it's true. I also care, as a Darwinian, about the origin of it, and I'm interested in the origin of it, and I'm inclined to agree with the um, in implied suggestion of the questioner that it may be that religion itself has no advantage, but it may be that it's a byproduct of some other psychological disposition which does. But that is an entirely separate question from whether it's true. And I don't like it when people say, oh, humans need it, or we have it built into us in our genes, or Darwinian natural selection has built into it. Therefore, that somehow validates it. Of course, it doesn't validate it. It merely says that it's been built into us by natural selection, just as all sorts of other probably disagreeable things have been built into us. Doesn't mean we can't try to cure ourselves. Right, okay, can I just... I have experienced plenty of things which could be called transcendental. I've experienced the feeling of almost mystical wonder that I get when I look up at the stars, look up at the Milky Way, uh, contemplate the galaxies receding from us, listen to a Schubert quintet, uh, read a sonnet of Shakespeare. These are all things which only a human mind is capable of doing. So may I ask you? Let, 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 okay, sorry. Only a human mind is capable of doing that. And a human mind is capable of doing those things because the human mind has been put together in the brain put. as a highly complicated organization that has evolved over some four billion years of evolution, putting together nervous systems. It is a stunning achievement of evolution to have put together the human brain, the human brain that is capable of being moved by such things. I yield to no one in my capacity to be moved by what you call the, the transcendental. What I do not do, however, is to indulge in mystical nonsense about it being there before there were brains or the equivalent of brains. A quote from Kurt Wise, 
who is an American geologist. He studied geology at Harvard, no less, under Stephen Jay Gould, no less. And he was set for a, a good career as an academic geologist, which all his life he had desperately wanted. The problem was, it came from within, it was his religious upbringing, his firewall of faith. And he couldn't reconcile the two, his scientific education with his religion. And he literally got a pair of scissors and went right through the Bible and cut out every verse that would have to go if he accepted his scientific education. And in, in the end, he decided there was nothing left of his Bible. He therefore tossed out science and said, and from then on, he said, um, with that in great sorrow, I tossed into the fire all my dreams and hopes in science. And he goes on, I am a young age creationist because that is my understanding of the scripture. As I shared with my professors years ago when I was in college, if all the evidence in the universe turns against creationism, I would be the first to admit it, but I would still be a creationist because that is what the word of God seems to indicate. Here I must stand. If religion can do that to a highly educated Harvard geologist, just think what it can do to an average school child or student. Thank you. The, the scientists that I respect are scientists who work hard to be understood, to use language clearly, to use words correctly, and to understand what is going on. We have been subjected to a kind of word salad of scientific jargon used out of context with in inappropriately, apparently uncomprehendingly. Um, there is a deep confusion going on here between the properties of things within the universe and the properties of the universe itself. It is one thing to say that the universe contains objects that have sentience and the various other properties that you mentioned. Of course it contains objects that, that have sentience. We are among those objects. So are dogs. So are chimpanzees. The universe contains sentience. The universe is not sentient. This is the one thing, Deepak, you seem not to understand. You're constantly confusing explanations at the level of what goes on inside the universe with the universe itself. It's not enough to say the universe contains sentience, contains purpose, etc., and say, therefore, the universe is sentient, the universe is purposeful. Evolution, you say, has a purpose, diversity, because what we see is diversity. Of course what we see is diversity. That's the consequence of evolution. But you mistake when you think Time. that evolution is Time. driven towards it. Time is over. How much time do I have when? to respond? How much sure. time? I would just add to that that um, these, the science of any uh, one century is going to be superseded by the science of future centuries, such that if somebody from, say, the Middle Ages were to come, were to be brought back by a time machine to, to now, they would find mobile phones and, and uh, computers and, and uh, jet airplanes, they would be indistinguishable from magic. They would appear to be supernatural. So I am a materialist. I don't believe there is anything supernatural. But don't think of that as a denigration of the natural, because if you were to come back in 500 years' time, you wouldn't have seen nothing yet. The, the physics, the engineering, the biology of 500 years' time will be so far advanced over today's that we might well fall on our knees and worship it as supernatural, but it wouldn't be. It would be the evolved uh, natural. The question is not whether individual people who happen to be religious or who happen not to be religious are good or bad. Uh, the question is whether religion itself is. I think there are aspects of religion which are bad in, in themselves. I think that the idea of blind faith believing something without evidence and sheltering behind the right to hold faith uh, such that you can justify doing bad things because you're 
religion, your faith tells you it's the right thing to do. Many, many good and righteous people who believe themselves to be good and righteous have done terrible things precisely because they believe that they're doing it for their God. So faith, blind faith, can have that bad effect. Uh, for myself as a scientist, I'm accustomed to saying that the thing that I really object to about religion is that it teaches us to be satisfied with not understanding, teaches us to be satisfied with pseudo-explanations which are really not explanations at all, things that sound good. Things that sound like an explanation, but which really aren't, which appeal to the emotions but don't actually explain anything. So I think that religion in that sense can be the enemy of science, the enemy of truth. But this evening I'm reflecting more that what may really be the enemy of truth and the enemy of science is willful obscurantism, whether it comes from religion or not. The, the measure of the, fact, the factuality of uh, evolution is the same as in any other science. Um, some of the things that scientists have found are found with great confidence. Scientists are always open to uh, the possibility of being proved wrong at some point in the future, but there are some things that seem at, at any one stage in history far better demonstrated than others. Um, the fact of evolution is about as well demonstrated as anything we know. It is absolutely certain by the normal standards, the same kind of standards as we are certain that um, the earth rotates and, and the sun doesn't go around the earth. Um, that formally we have to say, well, that, that's a hypothesis that might one day be disproved, but we all know that it won't be. And evolution has now come into that category. I don't mean that Darwin's theory of natural selection, as, at least as the only driving force of evolution, um, that uh, probably should be treated as slightly more uncertain, but the fact of evolution itself, by which I mean the fact that all living creatures that have ever been looked at on this planet are cousins sharing a common ancestor, that is uh, as, as secure a fact as, as, as any in science. My attitude to science is that we are fundamentally trying to understand how things work. Science is very difficult, it's very difficult to understand how things work. The hard problem of consciousness has been mentioned, the problem of the origin of the universe, the problem of the origin of life, the problem of how life has this uncanny appearance of, of being designed, the size of the universe, the scale of the universe, uh, how embryology works. These are all deeply difficult questions. They require hard scientific work and in all cases, I think I'm right in saying that scientific work consists of explaining complicated things in terms of the interactions of their parts or of simpler things. So we always try to explain complex things in terms of simpler things. We do not resort to magical language. We do not snow our audience with highfalutin sounding words that don't actually mean anything. We use words that actually have meaning. We use uh, expressions that can be tested. We work hard at understanding the universe in terms of its component parts. We don't invent superarching entities which have no explanation in themselves. We don't invoke ideas like the universe has consciousness, the universe has awareness, atoms have awareness. If we have a difficult problem like awareness, we explain it in terms of the interactions between small parts working together in ways that scientists understand. If Freeman Dyson ever said atoms are aware, then he's wrong. I don't think he said it. I think he should sue you. Wow. Although I can't recall ever having kissed a photograph, I have wept when reading poetry, when listening to music. I think that those on this side have come to rather resent the suggestion that religion has a monopoly on emotion, on poetry. <laughs> on sympathy, on 
empathy. Everybody in this room, I dare say, has felt deep grief at the sight or the thought of a suffering individual somewhere in the world, maybe even of another species. That does seem to be something in humanity, to feel empathy with suffering. And as a Darwinian, I can offer explanations for that. I won't do it now because there isn't time. But it is a travesty that has somehow become widely accepted that if you throw out religion, you throw out the Good Samaritan, you throw out weeping at a sonnet of Shakespeare or at a Schubert quartet. It has nothing whatever to do with religion in the sense of the supernatural. Of course, you can redefine religion as covering all these uh, emotional, artistic aspects. And in that case, of course, there's no contest. But I suggest that that's confusing and that we need to define religion as belief in something supernatural. You get your beliefs not from evidence, but from faith, from revelation, from tradition, from scripture, from authority. Now, all those are very bad reasons to believe anything. Evidence is the only reason to believe something. And that's the second point that I want to make in closing. Uh, but the first one, the, the main one I, I want to make is that uh, we are all in this together. We are all uh, capable of the same kinds of emotions. We're all capable of wanting to free the slaves and all the things, all the good things that have been talked about. Whether we're religious or not, uh, you cannot give religion the credit for any of those things. They are a part of humanity. The good things are part of humanity, just as the bad things are part of humanity, whether you're religious or not. The personal story segment tonight, do you believe in God? Increasingly, fewer Americans do. According to a Pew poll, 12% of us do not have a belief in a higher power, up from 8% in 1987, and that group includes agnostics. In Europe, the rise of atheism and of Gnosticism is stunning. According to a Zuckerman study in Sweden, as many as 85% of the population are non-believers. Japan, 65%. France, 54%. And in Britain, 44% do not believe in God in Great Britain. This now is a man who understands that position. Richard Dawkins, the author of the mega-selling mess book, The God Delusion. I think it takes more faith to be like you, an atheist, than like me, a believer, and it's because of nature. You know, I just don't think we could have lucked out to have the tides come in, the tides go out, sun go up, sun go down. Don't think it could have happened. We have a very full understanding of why the tides go in, the tides go out, about, of why the continents drift about, of why life is there. Science is ever more piling on the evidence, piling on the understanding. But it had to get there. I understand that you, you know, the uh, physiology of it, if, if you will, but it had, to, it had to come from somewhere. And that is the leap of faith that you guys make, that it just happened. Well, a leap of faith, you don't actually need a leap of faith. You, you're the one who needs a leap of faith because you are actually, you, the onus is on you to say why you, do, you believe in something. There's an infinite number of gods you could believe in. I take it you don't believe in Zeus or Apollo or Thor. You believe in presumably the Jesus. Christian god, Jesus. So Jesus was yeah. a real guy. But, I could see him. Yeah. You know, and I know what he did. And so I'm not positive that Jesus is God, but I'm throwing in with Jesus rather than thrown in with you guys because you guys can't tell me how it all got here you guys don't know. we're working on it physicists are oh, working. when you get it then maybe i'll listen yeah. well no i mean if you look at the history of science over the, over the centuries yeah. the amount that's that's gained in knowledge each century is stupendous in the beginning of the 21st century we don't know everything we have to be humble we have to in humility say that there's a lot that we still don't know and you know being humble is a christian virtue well, so there you go. Of course it is. All right. When you guys figure it out, then you come back here and tell me, because until that time, I'm sticking with Judeo-Christian philosophy and my religion of Roman Catholicism, because it helps me as a person. Ah, that's different. If it, you know, if helps, it helps you, that's absolutely. great. And but I'm that doesn't mean it's true. And, that, well, it's true for me. You see, I, I believe You it. mean true for you is different from true for anybody else? Have yeah, something to be absolutely, true for you? because I can't Some prove... Some things either got to be true or not. I can't... No, no. I can't prove to you that Jesus is God. 
So that truth is mine and mine alone. But you can't prove to me that Jesus is not. So you have to stay in your little belief system. You can't prove system. that Zeus is not. You can't prove that Apollo is not. Or well, I saw Apollo, not. man. He's, he was down there. He's not looking good. Now, we also differ in the sense that you feel that religion has been a bane, B-A-N-E, to civilization. And I feel atheism has. And I will po point to the worst mass murderers in uh, modern times, Hitler, Stalin, Mao, and Pol Pot, all confirmed atheists, all people who wanted to wipe out religion. Now, I know you can point to the Crusades and you can point to Al-Qaeda right now. I mean, it's there and there's no question. But I say that I'm thrown in with the Founding Fathers of the United States, which saw religion, spirituality, as a moderating influence, as a good thing if people embrace the true tenets. Go ahead. The Founding Fathers of the United States were secularists above all. So some of them were religious, some of them were not, but they were above all secularists who believed in keeping church and state They separate. had to because of the oppression in Europe. That was what they were, that, right. precisely. But I mean, that was almost they were all of them, they all said a prayer before their deliberations. In their letters, and I have almost all their letters, they all reference the deity. Our Declaration of Independence references heavily. But they saw it as a moderating influence because the federal government at that point couldn't control the country. And they it, said, you know, if yeah. people follow Jesus, then the country is going to be better. It may well be a moderating influence. As for Hitler and Stalin and so on, I mean, of, of course, H Hitler, by the way, was a Roman Catholic. No, he never he was, was. He was raised in that home, yeah, well, but he we, rejected we, it early okay, on. We can, we can dispute that. Um, Stalin was an atheist, no question. Uh, but Stalin did the bad things he did, not because he was an atheist. I mean, Hitler and Stalin oh. both had moustaches, but we don't say it was their moustaches <laughs> that made them evil. I don't think they had any moral foundation, any of those guys. I will say... I don't either. Your book is fascinating, and you know, congratulations on your success. Thanks for coming on in here. Thank you very much indeed. But I don't try to get a version of the blasphemy law passed to prevent people chewing gum or reversing their cap. So what if I'm offended? So what if my feelings are hurt? Does that give me the right to prevent others from expressing their opinions? However, is there a time when it is right to be offended? I think so, yes. We should be offended when children are denied a proper education. We should be offended when children are told they will spend eternity in hell. We should be offended when medical science, for example, stem cell research, is compromised by... <laughs> compromised, I should say, by the bigoted opinions of powerful and, above all, well-financed ignoramuses. Uh, a web question. It's from Cassandra Devine in Victoria. It's to Richard Dawkins. Why do you feel the need to express your views so stridently uh, when they're not always welcome? Isn't it rather like going around to playgrounds and telling children that Santa Claus isn't real? <laughs> in, in modern English vocabulary, it's more or less impossible to use the word atheist without preceding it with the adjective strident. They simply go together. I am not strident, I'm no more strident than anybody else. Um, now, is it like disillusioning children about Santa Claus? The weird thing is that children manage to grow out of Santa Claus and some <laughs> Sir, I'm being allowed by the friend I used to work with to come back. I cannot afford to build my life on hallucination but on Jesus Christ who is the rock and it is that I have asked you to address please. You are obviously sincere uh, but obviously I do not share your beliefs and I think you are hallucinating. That's all I can say. I don't doubt your sincerity. Okay. Every night on television we see satire, we see comedy, we see people poking fun at politicians, at all sorts of things. Why should religion, especially the Muslim religion, why should that be immune from people making fun of it? Not that this is making fun of it, I understand, yeah. but even so, why should you think that Islam should be uniquely immune from the things that politicians are not immune from and the rest of us are not immune from? Why are you so privileged in taking offense?
You're talking about the people who are in the land just like you and me. Our Prophet and Allah, they are completely different. Our holy book is completely different. I think your thinking is very narrow. You thinking politicians like a Tony Blair, George Bush, you can joke about them and you can joke about Islam. I think you haven't got knowledge enough. You should go to have some more study and then come back on the, on the telephone to talk to me. Politicians really exist. This is probably going to be the most simplest one for you to answer, but what if you're wrong? Well, what if I'm wrong? I mean, anybody could be wrong. We could all be wrong about the flying spaghetti monster and the pink unicorn and the flying teapot. Um, you happen to have been brought up, I would presume, in the Christian faith. You know what it's like not to believe in a particular faith because you're not a Muslim, you're not a Hindu. Why aren't you a Hindu? Because you happen to have been brought up in America, not in India. If you'd been brought up in, Indo in India, you'd be a Hindu. If you were brought up in, in um, Denmark in the time of the Vikings, you'd be believing in Wotan and Thor. If you were brought up in, in classical Greece, you'd be believing in, in Zeus. If you were brought up in Central Africa, you'd be believing in the great juju up the mountain. I mean, there's no particular reason to pick on the Judeo-Christian God in which by the sheerest accident you happen to have been brought up and, and ask me the question, what if I'm wrong? What if you're wrong about the great juju at the bottom of the sea? I think it's the question really and like a scientist, Nobel Prize winning scientist like Peter Meadow would say that the question why, why are we here can't be answered by science and I, I don't understand how we can say with such confidence that it can. Well, what I would say about the question why is why do you think you have any right to ask it? Uh, it's not a meaningful question except unless you um, specify the kind of answer you're, you're, you're expecting. As a biologist, it's very easy to answer the question, why do birds have wings, for example? I mean, we can do that in, Dar in Darwinian terms. If you say, however, um, why do mountains exist? There are some questions which simply don't deserve an answer. I mean, the question, um, why do mountains exist? You can give an answer in terms of the geological um, processes that give rise to, to, to mountains, but that's not what you want, is it? You want something about the purpose of mountains. What is the purpose of a mountain? It's a silly question. Doesn't deserve an answer. The mere fact that you can ask a question, the mere fact that you can frame a question in the English language doesn't mean that it's entitled to an answer. If I say to you, what is the, what is the color of jealousy? It's a perfectly grammatical English sentence, but it's not a question that deserves an answer. The correct answer is, don't ask such a silly question. But is it not part of the human condition to ask these it questions? It may well be part of the human condition to ask silly questions, yes. <laughs> God ordered Abraham to make a burnt offering of his longed-for son. Abraham built an altar, put firewood upon it, and trussed Isaac up on top of the wood. His murdering knife was already in his hand when an angel dramatically intervened with the news of a last-minute change of plan. God was only joking after all. <laughs> Tempting Abraham and testing his faith. A modern moralist cannot help but wonder how a child could ever recover from such psychological trauma. <laughs> By the standards of modern morality, this disgraceful story is an example simultaneously of child abuse bullying in two asymmetrical power relationships, and the first recorded use of the Nuremberg defense, I was only obeying orders. <laughs> God's monumental rage whenever his chosen people flirted with a rival god resembles nothing so much as sexual jealousy of the worst kind, and again it should strike a modern moralist as far from good role model material. The temptation to sexual infidelity is readily understandable, even to those who do not succumb, and it's a staple of fiction and drama from Shakespeare to bedroom farce. But the apparently irresistible temptation to whore with foreign gods is something we moderns find harder to empathize with. To my naive eyes, thou shalt have no other gods but me, would seem an easy enough commandment to keep, 
a doddle, one might think, compared with thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, or her ass, <laughs> or her ox. Um, my question is for Professor Dawkins. Considering that uh, atheism cannot possibly have any sense of absolute morality, would it not then be an irrational leap of faith, which atheists themselves so harshly condemn, for an atheist to decide between right and wrong? <clears throat> absolute morality, the, the, the absolute morality that a religious person might profess would include what? Stoning people for adultery? Death for apostasy? Uh, punishment for breaking the Sabbath? These are all things which are religiously based absolute moralities. I don't think I want an absolute morality. I think I want a morality that, that is thought out, reasoned, argued, discussed, and... <laughs> based upon, I could almost say, intelligent design. Um, <laughs> I care about what's true. Um, I mean, do you actually believe in your Muslim faith? Do you believe that Muhammad split the moon in two? Do you believe that Muhammad flew to heaven on a winged horse, for example? I, I pay you the compliment of assuming that you, that you don't. No, I do. I believe in miracles. You believe that? Yes. You believe that Muhammad went to heaven on a winged horse? Yes, I believe in God. I believe in miracles. I believe in revelation. I mean, the point here is that let's assume I'm wrong, Richard. I'm yeah, wrong. Let's. Um... Let, let's assume I'm wrong. <laughs> I'm wrong. I'm happy to concede that, Richard. I'm happy to concede it. If you, if you actually believe Mohammed flew to heaven on a winged horse, that's an anti-scientific belief. And that could be wrong. But well, that it well is wrong. But I mean, that doesn't change... Yeah. <laughs> that doesn't change... Uh, how do you know it's wrong? Oh, come on. You're a man of the 21st century. No, I'm You're... just asking. It comes back to my original question. The, the well, rational position is the agnostic. The rational position is the agnostic position. Why up there? What, the I mean, the know... rational position. I, I didn't say up there. I didn't pick a place. Okay, you well, what, a place. Why would a winged um, horse be the, be the way to get to heaven if uh, it's not up there? I, I, asked, I, asked, I asked a question about... Pr you asked about proof. I'm all for saying I can't prove it. But can you prove he didn't do it? I mean, this is, can this I is the end of debate. Can I prove he didn't fly to heaven this on is the a winged I'm just asking on your criteria. I'm just asking on No, I can't opinion. prove it, and I can't prove it wasn't a golden unicorn. But I'm or... fascinated that you'd rather... I'm fascinated that you're... If the Almighty God appears suddenly on the cloud or on the earth or part of the universe, what is your reaction? Are you going to believe or are you going to go against him? What would it take for you to believe in God, not just miracles? Yeah, I mean... Th Popping his head th through the clouds. Yeah, that, that, that's the thing I've, I've worried about a lot. Um, <laughs> obviously... <laughs> it would do wonders for the book. The re would the world be a better place if religion disappeared tomorrow? Uh, yes. Uh, it's about all the good things we discussed that yeah. you recognise. Do you believe in a virgin birth, Christina? I do. I do. Mm. I believe in miracles, too. Mm. Do you what do you think about this, well, I don't know about the virgin birth or not? Do you think that's key to being a Christian? Do you think all those sort of fundamental it's, key... It's, it's up to them. What they, if they want to believe supernatural nonsense, that is up to them. But don't <laughs> force it on the rest of us. You do not believe in the existence of God, but you believe in aliens. But the very existence of your animosity, hatred, and mockery towards him proves your hypocrisy. I suggest that you find the longest crowbar you can find to pull your head out of your behind. <laughs> Bullshit dog -like. I read your book about the Bible. It is totally sucks ass and is biased and one-sided propaganda. Your theory sucks. You are not as wise as you think you are. You hypocrites want to condemn anybody for making mistakes or believing different from your bullshit, retard, atheism dogma. <laughs> Dawkins' books are fucking stupid bullshit. <laughs>